morning, everyone. Hello. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us Monday, starting off your week with the Forbes funds. And I appreciate everyone's patience with my email that went out this morning because we were having an issue with our e-newsletter. Um, but I'm so glad that so many of you are able to join issue free um, and, and able to get on the call. I'm really excited for the conversation we're going to have today with four folks um, from the University of Pittsburgh, specifically with the engagement and community affairs team. I know this is a, a much anticipated call, given how many emails I got in response to my uh, outreach this morning, making sure that the link was working. So um, as a reminder for any folks who are new to this conversation or this space that we host, these conversations take place weekly as a place to share resources and opportunities with community members, create a space to convene, build trust and connection and conversation um, between members of GPNP, but more broadly, all members of the Forbes Funds ecosystem. Um, and the goal is to better understand short and long-term community needs during this time. We started during the pandemic since March of 2020. And since that time, we've had 5,115 meetings with 43,690 participants. So thank you to all of you who keep showing up in this space, asking questions and continuing to be involved with the Forbes funds. It's allowed us to stretch um, the, the perspectives we receive and the, the capacity building that we provide to different nonprofit organizations. Um, for our conversation today, there is an alignment overarching with the sustainable development goals, the social determinants of health, and the eight R's. These calls for community solutions are part of a broader 24 months of learning hosted by the Forbes Funds, where we can provide response to topics that came up at the GPNP Summit last November, um, past summits or conversations that we've been in invited into since that time. But more directly, um, we're, we'll be hearing, as I shared, from the Office of Engagement and Com uh, Community Affairs this morning. And you can see the, the brief mission on the screen. Um, the description of the call shared by the team with us is that the ECA team will share more about its work, calls for partnership across its engaged campus, anchor initiatives, neighborhood commitments, and lifelong learning leadership. So all things that I know the folks on these calls weekly um, really care about. This is quite a impressive series of bios. Um, so just to make sure that everyone you know, can really appreciate the expertise and um, experience that we're getting on the call this morning. Um, I'm gonna go through the bios very quickly. So Jamie Ducar, who also happens to be a GPNP advisory team member, began her career in higher education at the University of Pittsburgh in 2017 after a 10 year career as a human services practitioner and nonprofit consultant. As the assistant vice chancellor of the engaged campus, she enables Pitt to be an engaged campus and anchor institution by ensuring Pitt is a visible and responsive collaborator with its local communities. To accomplish this, she is, uh, serves as the institution as the chair of the Community Engaged Scholarship Forum, Forum and also supports Place-Based Justice Network and WE, the Social Fabric Project of the Aspen Institute. Um, you can reach out to Jamie for all things Oakland, public service, volunteerism, capacity building, general partnership, or community engagement um, as a professional development opportunity. Next up, Lisa Sharfstein, who is the director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. Lisa, I hope that uh, I pronounced that correctly. Osher or Osher, um, I'm sure you'll tell us when you'll jump on in a second. Um, for herself and for others, Lisa embraces the ethos of lifelong learning. Throughout her career, Lisa has demonstrated this by working with leaders of all ages, from young children to older adults, and in multiple contexts and countries. Lisa recently concluded a four-year position as a board member for the College Reading and Learning Association and is active in her synagogue's education and social justice as initiatives. She earned a bachelor's from Ithaca College and MS and CAS degrees from Syracuse University. Keith Caldwell, <clears throat> excuse me, is the executive director of Place-Based Initiatives and um, for the Office of Community Engagement and Affairs. In this role, he supports Pitt's neighborhood commitments in Homewood, the Hill District, and in Hazelwood. Through the community engagement centers, he's able to make long-term commitments in developing mutually beneficial partnerships that strengthen both the university and our communities. Prior to joining the team, he worked for 14 years with the Pitt School of Social Work, including serving as the chair of the BASW program and most recently the associate dean for student success. He he received his doctorate in education from the Pitt School of Education, master in social work from Pitt School of Social Work, and bachelor of social work from Niagara University. Pivotal to her role, Shatera also supports the Buy, Build, Hire local program at Pitt. Um, she's the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Anchor Initiatives. Pitt's commitment to hiring more of our neighbors, helping businesses grow, and awarding more construction, service, and purchasing contracts across the region. Additionally, she stewards Pitt's housing afford or affordability initiatives in its Walk to Work program and serves as a convener and resource partner to non-degree workforce development efforts across the university. 
Prior to joining the university, Shatera served as the Community Health and Employee Engagement Programs Manager at Highmark. Um, she also served previously as the Deputy Director for the City of Pittsburgh Department of Public Safety Division of Community Affairs and created a whole division and initiative um, across five different departments while she was there. She also received a Master of Business Administration from the Katz Graduate School of Business and a Bachelor of Science in Business Management from the University of Pittsburgh at Bradford. Um, so again, I just I wanted to share um, the extremely connected and impressive backgrounds that this group of individuals has. So thank you all for being on the call this morning. Um, Jamie, I believe you are up first, so I'll turn it over to you uh, to go ahead and get started with us. Awesome. Can I get a thumbs up on the slides? You're good. Great, great. great. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Uh, please excuse the fact that you can see me in one box and I'm talking out of another. We're making technology work for us this morning. Um, <clears throat> as Emily mentioned, my name is Jamie Dukar. I serve as Assistant Vice Chancellor for the Engage Campus here at the University of Pittsburgh. You'll learn a little bit more about what that means shortly. So thrilled to have so many friends in the room, members of our team. Uh, so there are some of you who know what we do, um, but there are more opportunities to get involved, to partner with the University of Pittsburgh, uh, and we're openly inviting you to call on our team to do so. Uh, so just really quickly, we want to walk through some key messages about community engagement at Pitt. We're really proud to have built up a culture and model that has made our team really successful. We wanna share that with you all as some of our current and potential partners. Uh, and we also wanna share a little bit more about our strategic priorities. So moving forward, what is it that you'll see out of our team as well as the university as a whole? So just wanna share at a high level <clears throat> our approach here at ECA. Um, we come from an office that was previously known as Community and Governmental Relations. Many folks know uh, when we were CGR, Jimmy Williams, John Wilds uh, were really some of the most visible folks that were helping us um, to know what it is, what's happening around the city and our region, and how it is University of Pittsburgh can play a role. Um, we've evolved a bit since uh, we started off, and uh, we have some nice messaging, which really just shares that we we completely recognize that nothing can be done with a single organization, a single institution. And for us, progress means that progress belongs to everyone. So when we're looking to partner, we strive to be a partner of choice at the individual level, at the team level, for small nonprofits and organizations, all the way up to some of our large multi-regional um, cross-sector initiatives like the Greater Pittsburgh Nonprofit Partnership. Um, we've got five principles that we like to share that really uh, help us set a strong foundation for our work. Uh, I'll very briefly move through these because we want to spend most of our time talking about our actual work, um, but want to share that we care with and about uh, using the tools of research, service, programming, and innovation. As a higher ed institution, we know that we're best sitting in our wheelhouse when we're able to partner um, on collaborative projects that help us to expand what you can do using research, to expand what you can do doing teaching and learning. Uh, and we're using innovative practices uh, within our office, but we're seeing all across campus that folks are really resourcing innovative ways to tap into community voice and start to use more community directed modalities for our partnerships. And to that end, right, we know that people have relationships with each other. Uh, so there are folks that know myself, that know Keith, that know Shatera, that know Lisa, and can trust us as individuals. And that might not make it up to the institutional level. So we're working day by day um, for accountability and also visibility to ensure that the strong relationship you might have with myself or one of my colleagues does roll all the way up to that pit as an institution. Uh, transparency, accountability, accessibility are the ways that we do that. Um, so you'll find that we're very open to just hopping on a call, responding immediately to an email. If there's an idea that you're not sure who the best point of contact is at Pitt, we are your people. We can help you find your people. 
We're dedicated to solutions that can take root and build long-term community capacity. So just wanna say here that our intention is to ensure that your organizations have what you need in order to best meet your mission and that the University of Pittsburgh is a partner in that, not looking to take the lead and bring you all along for the ride. And finally, we believe opportunity can and will be more widely shared in Pittsburgh. There are continued challenges in our region that we're aware of. We think that with, if we're all working together, if we're staying laser focused on a few key opportunities, that we will be able to shift uh, the quality of life within our region more broadly. So let's get into it. We have a single purpose here at ECA, which is to help folks find each other, and forge meaningful and more effective collaborations. So if you're currently in a collaborative relationship with the University of Pittsburgh, we wanna serve as an impact multiplier. We want to share that out, communicate it across the institution, pull in new partners that can help you think of things differently. If you don't currently have a partner at the University of Pittsburgh, where are the folks that can help you find who it is might help your organization find its best fit? Uh, so we've got some strategic priorities that we've been working on for the past year. It's amazing to think that we're already sort of in late March. Um, so we'll be thinking ahead to, to what it is our priorities are going to be next year. Um, but we just want to share a few things. One is that our community affairs goal is to build cleaner, safer, healthier, better connected communities adjacent to campus. That includes Oakland, but we also have some overlap with our neighborhood commitments as we completely understand that our students are living as neighbors, not just in Oakland, but in neighboring neighborhoods such as the Upper Hill District and Shenley Heights. We know we've got students in Hazelwood. We know we've got students all over. We want to help connect them and ensure that they've got a positive influence on their neighborhoods as well as their neighbors. We wanna grow our, our engagement with lifelong learning with residents 50 year, years old and better. You'll hear from Lisa about that. We wanna expand both community and campus involvement in Pitt's neighborhood commitments and CECs. We also wanna grow our ability to find and support our engaged scholars and practitioners. And I'll share a little bit more about that. Uh, Shatera will be sharing uh, more about our anchor initiatives, which grow economic opportunity for residents and businesses across the region. And we cannot forget to mention, we have a set of youth programs serving kindergarten through eighth grade that sit at the intersection of our engaged campus and neighborhood commitments that you all will most certainly want to know about. So let's get into it. So community affairs. So our community affairs team consists of myself, Justin Dandoy, who's our director of community affairs, and Caitlin Crowder, who's our new assistant director of community affairs. A lot of our work is holding the core functionality for the university that allows us to be good neighbors, to be present and accessible, and to think about what solutions are that help to build bridges within our communities. So to that end, our community affairs team staffs all of the neighborhood association meetings throughout Oakland. I serve as the chair of Oakland Task Force, which is a collaborative of all the different organizations and people that are interested in the livelihood of our dynamic neighborhood, which also happens to be the third largest economic center in the Commonwealth. Part of our community affairs infrastructure also includes getting our employees involved. So our employee volunteerism function is really important to our community affairs team. And we have an enabling strategy here at Pitt that allows for any staff role to spend 7.5 hours, which that's a work day for us, each month in service to themselves or in service to others through professional development or volunteerism. So if you all are used to working with our students on volunteer projects, please know that our staff are actually they have an enabling policy that allows them to get out and support their missions as well. If you're looking with someone with some particular expertise, we can help make some matches there for your organization. All right, I'm happy to pass this off to my colleague, Lisa. 
Good morning. Thank you, Jamie. And I'm very happy to tell you about the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. It is Osher, but um, sometimes we also say OLLI. So it's O-L-L-I because Osher Lifelong Learning Institute is a mouthful. But um, I'm happy to tell you about our 19-year uh, now history at the University of Pittsburgh. We are one of 125 Ollies that are located all across the country, and they're all associated with a university and all connected with the mission of creating a learning environment for adults who are 50 and better. That's how we say older adult community, 50 and better, and to nurture, nurture this lifelong passion for learning learning um, and foster the social connections that are an important part of healthy aging. And we here at Aliyah Pitt do that um, and meet our mission by offering over 300 of our own courses. They are short five-week courses that we offer in three different terms, spring, summer, fall. Um, and those courses are both online, about 65% of them remain online since the pandemic, and the rest are in person here on campus, or sometimes we are partnering now with communities um, and ho who are hosting some of our, our in-person uh, courses off campus. Um, we also have events and lectures and local travel. We're bringing back some domestic travel, international travel, all with the purpose of engaging the older adult learner by fostering social connection and maintaining a commitment to um, creating this dedicated learning environment for the older adult. We also um, are a gateway to the University of Pittsburgh for our members. Um, benefits of being part of the University of Pittsburgh include the ability to audit two undergraduate university classes every semester, which um, many of our members do take advantage of. They like our short five-week classes that have just their peers, but a lot of times they like that intergenerational learning. They like being in the classroom with undergraduates, or they just want the more in-depth exploration of a 16-week course. Um, we also, by being part of the University of Pittsburgh, are able to extend to our members discounts for cultural events so they can be part of the Pitt Arts Cheap Seats program and get discounted tickets to the ballet, to the opera, to the theater, and also just, just be a part of the University of uh, Community to have access to the shuttles, to the library, to the Wi-Fi, to be able to attend the many, many lectures and events that are here on campus. So we are membership based. So for one annual cost of $250, everything that I just mentioned is all included. It's all an, an all-inclusive membership fee. Um, we, members can also pay per term for $150, but we never want finances to be a barrier to any person who wants to join our organization. So we do have some very generous financial assistance available. And again, the purpose is to, to foster this, this really valuable um, engagement, both socially and intellectually, to have this environment. The members tell me stories that you know, they were really having a hard transition to retirement and that our program saved them, that they lost their social network, they lost their daily structure, and our program is able to provide that for our older residents. Um, they meet new friends, they stay active and engaged, and they really do add quite a bit to the university environment. I've had many um examples of instructors or undergraduate students who say how much they love interacting with our Ali members. So we're really, really pleased to be able to offer such a thriving program for adults who are not just here in Oakland, not just here in Pittsburgh, not just here in Allegheny County. We actually have members across, I believe now 24 different states because of our online capacity. So although the majority of the people we serve are here in Allegheny County, we now do have reach wherever our members might go, we're able to help um, provide services for them. All right, I think I am now passing it to Keith Caldwell.
Thanks, Lisa. You know, one thing you left out is that one of the great outcomes of this is that while folks may have earned degrees from other institutions, they're now really excited to be a part of the the, the Pitt network, and many consider themselves as strong of a Pitt alumnus from those programs as anything else. So it's a really wonderful program. Well, thanks for allowing me to join you all today. Uh, and appreciate the uh, generous introduction. I won't add anything other than that, uh, but I'm excited to talk to you about our neighborhood commitments. Um, we call them neighborhood commitments, but they're most visibly reflected by our community engagement centers. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. But the neighborhood commitment model was really uh, part of a strategic transition the university made in 2015. Jamie spoke a little bit to some of that transition of our office over time. Um, but at the time, the through the vision of uh, then Senior Vice Chancellor Kathy Humphrey, the leadership of then Chancellor Patrick Gallagher, um, came up with this idea around what happens if we coalesce as, mu of mu as much of our community engagement effort as possible into a very localized neighborhood level experience and really moved from collaboration to and coordination to deep commitment and partnership. Um, and that was where the, uh, the neighborhood commitment model was Born. Um, our Vice Chancellor Lena Stilio was brought in to, to bring that vision to life. And as a result, we are now in three of Pittsburgh's neighborhoods, Homewood, the Hill District, and Hazelwood. Um, these are spaces that we had an opportunity to be invited into the community and to really advance uh, the kinds of partnerships that we could develop. One thing I'll always be clear on with folks is that the reason my title isn't ED of CECs only is that, you know, over time, we're looking to build this office's capacity uh, in my role in particular to support community engaged work and neighborhood commitments uh, further across the city, across the region. And as Jamie highlighted, the importance of connecting those capacity building, those partnership requests is not restricted to these three neighborhoods by any means. Um, so we want to continue to develop that over time. But for right now, we're still a relatively young organization with our first CEC in Homewood having been opened in 2017. Uh, we moved into a temporary space in the Hill District, the Blakey Building, where we're currently um, operating about 8,500 square feet there. And are really excited to move in as an anchor tenant into the new Granada Theater in the Hill District. Um, I always like to emphasize with folks that one of our strategies uh, from a real estate perspective is to rent and not buy. We like to be able to invest in existing community partners and organizations. Um, and so as an anchor tenant, we're excited to be part of the reopening of the new Granada that's been closed in 68. And our emerging work in Hazelwood. We can go ahead to the next slide. I'll highlight a little bit more about our strategy in each of these areas. So... One of the things that I also like to highlight is that our neighborhood commitments are grounded in alignment with community goals and community wisdom. Um, so they look a little different in each neighborhood based on the priorities of the neighborhood. But there's guiding principles that are really important for us to reinforce every step of the way. One is a long-term commitment. I'd say in one way that long-term commitment term commitment goes backwards, right? That these are neighborhoods where we as an institution um, have had partnerships, uh, collaborations uh, for going back decades. Um, and that's a long-term commitment and relationships that we're able to build upon um, and gave us a deep network of collaborators that our job is to be able to stitch together um, great university community partnerships. We have a pretty lean staffing model for each of our uh, neighborhood commitments, just four staff members. Um, that really ensures that we focus on not building programs exclusively with building partnerships that develop new programs and opportunities between university and community members. And part of what makes that possible is our community engagement center. Um, the community engagement centers are vibrant spaces for collaboration and partnership. Um, in Homewood, uh, it's about a 20,000 square foot facility. Again, one that we rent um, for a long term. Um, but that space becomes active because we're able to develop partnerships with university members and community organizations, aligning university resources and opportunities with community goals and wisdom. While these three principles guide each of our community engagement centers, um, the work that happens in each of them is quite unique and aligned with community goals. So our emphasis in Homewood is around health, wellness, and education. And that gets brought to life in a couple of different ways, not least of which is that we have different departments at the university that have invested in having permanent space within the community engagement center. So for example, the School of Health and Rehab Sciences has the wellness pavilion. 
And that is a space that provides access for programming um, and service provision from across 30 different health-related disciplines. PT, OT, dietetics, nutrition, athletic training, um, and a whole host of others that are available, communication sciences and disorders. And they've just advanced through a long um, effort of partnership, um, a MOU to provide free services to referred individuals from Alma Ilory, um, the longstanding health care uh, facility right there in Homewood. It's a really fantastic example of our model of, again, finding ways to invest and partner with existing organizations, never to be in a position where we're seen or actually duplicating or displacing really core community partners. So we're excited for that to be able to advance. In the Hill District, aligned with the original visioning through the Hill District Community Development Corporation's New Granada STEAM Task Force, where folks came together and asked, um, what do we want this catalytic development of New Granada Square to do for the community? There was a real emphasis on digital inclusion and in STEAM and STEM education. Part of that is because the Hill District sits between two of the three largest economic engines in the Commonwealth, downtown Pittsburgh and Oakland. Um, and a lot of that economic activity is driven by the digital economy. Um, and a lot of residents of the Hill District have been left out of that experience. So we really emphasize through partnerships with our School of Engineering, uh, with Pitt IT, with our School of Computing Information, an opportunity um, to build out partnerships and program that advance STEAM education, for young people as well as adults. Uh, by STEAM, I mean um, science, technology, engineering, um, math, and then the A can be all kinds of things. Architecture, art, awesome, whatever we wanna be able to incorporate in there to make it a well-rounded experience for folks. Um, and then in Hazelwood, uh, we'll have a community engagement center there probably in 2026, 2027. Uh, we're partnering with the Center of Life on a new development that they're doing down in Hazelwood Green. And the emphasis there is around the emerging life sciences industry. For folks who aren't familiar, the university is building a bioforge, a substantial biomanufacturing facility down on Hazelwood Green, as opposed to forging iron and steel, they'll be forging small pieces of biological material uh, that help advance gene and cell therapies. So it's a very exciting opportunity. And we really wanna make sure that that emerging economy um, uh, industrial area benefits current Hazelwood residents, both from a standpoint of workforce, STEAM and STEM education, um, and inclusive community development. We've partnered with a lot of great folks on that. I see Dr. Daniel Davis on here. She's been a great partner in our workforce development efforts with this work. So we're excited to advance that as well. Our CECs, last but not least, have these points of emphasis, but find ways to partner with all 16 schools at the university, providing access to um, entrepreneurship development, workforce opportunities, and many others. Not the least of which is our youth educational opportunities, the Gizmondi Neighborhood Education Program. Through the generosity of a member of the Board of Trustees and a great visionary leader, John Gizmondi, we've been able to take a series of programs like our STEAM Saturdays program in the Hill District, a tutoring program called Pitt and Rich and Homewood and others, and build out a really exciting infrastructure under the leadership of Brandon Ballard to advance our ability to be great partners in youth educational programming in these communities and in others over time. So I've given you a lot of information. There's a lot more I'd be excited to share, but I want to make sure all of my colleagues have time as well. Um, as a as a Passover to my colleague Shatara Murphy, I'll note that our CECs have a full-time workforce development counselor who works in each of the neighborhoods to help ensure that folks have access to employment opportunities at the University of Pittsburgh, which is just one aspect of the exciting anchor work that Shatera does. So I'll pass it off to Shatera. Thank you, Keith. Uh, before I get into, well, let me introduce myself. My name is Shatera Murphy. I am the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Anchor Initiatives for the University of Pittsburgh. Before I get into the university's specific anchor initiatives, I want to just take a, a quick step back and actually define what an anchor institution is. And so um, typically an anchor institution is defined as a large organization that has a significant presence and a long-term commitment in a specific place, meaning that organization is highly unlikely to uproot and relocate. So with that permanent placing in a community, that institution plays a very critical role in the well-being um, of the community and the region. They often serve as uh, one of the largest employers in the region. 
a major purchaser of goods and services and a significant landowner. Uh, so therefore, the sustainability of that institution is closely tied to the economic well-being uh, to that region. And so at Pitt, we understand that. And so therefore, we are owning um, our position as an anchored institution in this region because we are aware that uh, we do play a role in the health um, of the region. And so we define our anchor initiatives as, um, Jimmy, if you want to advance it, thank you. We define our anchor initiatives as a community-centered, place-based suite of strategies that we use to help uh, advance the economic and social progress of this region. So we do that in, in three ways. The first is through our Buy, Build, Hire local program. Uh, historically, uh, the workforce of an anchor institution does not reflect the local demographic of the community where it sits. So in an effort to increase local hiring, um, we can enhance the economic opportunities for residents and communities around the University of Pittsburgh. We also understand that we spend a substantial amount on goods and services. And uh, historically and in the past, most of these purchases were from non-local vendors. So being intentional about being an acre institution, uh, we know that supporting local procurement, construction, professional services um, can benefit locally owned businesses, keep that money here in this region and really help um, advance the economy. And we also know that we see uh, more minority women owned diverse businesses um, locally uh, than we do um, um, from some of our non-local vendors that we were using. And so ultimately through the Buy, Build, Hire program, we want to focus on local hiring, procurement, um, procurement, procurement, excuse me, efforts uh, to make sure that we are leveraging the economic power that we have to address local inequity and contribute positively to this region. Another component of the anchor work is the um, housing affordability investments. And so Pitt is committed to this uh, two ways. One is more of an external focus. The other is an internal focus, but collectively they support the sustainability of the Oakland community. So we are a significant investor in the um, Oakland Community Land Trust. Uh, we have a historic investment in the Oakland Development Fund, and we actively participate um, on its board of directors. And so for those of you that don't know what a community land trust is, it really breaks down home ownership in a shared equity model. So the Oakland Community Land Trust will own the land, but the homeowner will own the home um, that actually sits on the land. So it does give that homeowner an opportunity to own a home at a more affordable rate. And so internally, we have a forthcoming walk to work program. And so that provides eligible employees within the university an opportunity to receive incentives um, for living and investing in homes in Oakland neighborhoods. And so this is uh, specifically attractive for our employees who fall below that 80% of the area median income. So it's it could be rental assistance. It could be help with um, down payment for a home. It could be if you own a home already uh, in the Oakland neighborhood, investing for some um, rehab to that home. And so the third component of our anchor work is convening of our workforce development efforts. And so, um, as I stated, we are one of the largest employers in the region, but we're also a developer of talent. And so we have a wide range of programs and opportunities that are specifically targeted to uh, those who don't have a degree. A lot of the times people say, you know, I don't have a degree, I can't teach, I don't see where I fit um, at the University of Pittsburgh. Well, through our workforce development efforts, we are still providing um, pathways and pipelines to career opportunities to those who do not have a degree. And lastly, I will talk about um, our strategic priorities. So one, we want to make sure that we're increasing awareness for uh, Pitt's anchor initiatives. The university and its leadership is very committed uh, to the role that we play uh, to the economic advancement of this region. So much so they hired me <laughs> to come and, and do this work uh, on behalf of the university. So that is one uh, area in which we can see that the university is really committed uh, to these anchor initiatives. We also, um, hired 191 full-time staff employees from Oakland, Homewood, Hill District, 
um, in Greater Hazelwood area. So you just previously heard from Keith, who uh, mentioned where our community commitments are, um, and they are in those four areas. And so our hiring efforts are hyper-local and they align with the locations of our CECs. We also uh, were featured in Penn's Institute for Urban Research. Uh, this is a, a huge accomplishment for the university. Uh, we were uh, one of seven, I believe, uh, universities that were featured in this publication. And so as I talked about our buy, build, hire local efforts, uh, one of those things was making sure that we're awarding more uh, procurement and purchasing contracts locally. So last year, uh, we're, we're happy to say that $161 million of our direct spend and non-construction spend were from suppliers and vendors here uh, in the city of Pittsburgh. And also keeping with keeping things local, 24% of our construction spend was fulfilled by uh, minority and women-owned construction businesses in this area too. And anybody who knows about uh, construction numbers, uh, meeting goals and metrics, 24% is something to be really proud about. And again, we wanna make sure that we're just spreading awareness to our commitment uh, to the work that we're doing here in this region. And the last thing I want to highlight, excuse me, is three uh, new job training programs and apprenticeship programs uh, that we were able to launch. The first is a dental assistant program. Um, I really like this program. It creates a pathway to pipeline to uh, get more dentists in this region. We are coming up on a shortage of dentists. I'm not sure if any of you are, are following uh, that trend, but uh, we are aware of that. And so uh, through this dental assistance program, we're giving people the opportunity to go through a program. Uh, we make sure that the employer sponsors all of the materials that are needed, textbooks, laptops, um, all of that is sponsored. There is no cost to the participant in the program. And when they're done, they receive their certificate to be a dental assistant. And then staying connected to the university, if they want to take um, that job, that career to the next level, we also have some incentives for them to do that as well. And I want to let you all know that I believe the next cohort starts July the 8th. So this is a rolling application. So we will continue to take applications until the program is full. Another uh, program that we're really excited about is our Operating Engineers Apprentice Program. And so you come on with us um, to go through the Apprentice Program. We make sure that you are paid a full salary and benefits from day one. We sponsor uh, you to be in the union. So those dues are paid by us. Those uh, costs are not um, put on the participants in the program. And then we have a partnership with the Striction Strickland Research Training Program. Some of you may know it as a START program. And what it does is it trains people uh, through a custom workforce uh, development program. And it gives you experience needed to become an entry-level clinical research assistant, uh, which there's also uh, a short of clinical research assistants, not just in this region, but nationwide. And so again, uh, these are just a few examples of how we're showing our commitment to be an anchor institution in this region. And we are taking this work of advancing the social and economic progress of Southwestern Pennsylvania very serious. So thank you. Thanks, Shatara. So I am batting cleanup here and just want to share, um, you know, we understand we've given you a ton of information. This isn't even all that our team does, right? We do more. Um, so there's a large body of internal facing work. I want to shout out Jamel Price, who's our new Associate Director for Learning and Development. Together, we are working with our faculty, with our researchers to have them better understand how to be both effective and ethical collaborators when it comes to thinking about community partnerships. We're working with our offices of planning, design, and construction, as well as the Office of Real Estate to have them better understand the lived experiences of our neighbors and how it is the University of Pittsburgh needs to show up as an authentic partner. We're thinking about ways that we can continue to grow our employee reach throughout the region through volunteerism projects. Um, so again, if you have um, 
projects that you need and aren't looking for a student audience, you can reach out to myself or Justin Dandoy. We've got some information here on the screen for you. So if you go to our website at community.pit.edu, you'll be able to find lots of information. Uh, if you go to About Us, you'll find the four of us that were on this call today, as well as our team members. Um, but if you click around, you'll, you'll start to get a little bit more of a more well-rounded view on how it is you can have an opportunity to partner with the University of Pittsburgh. So I'm hoping we have a bit more time for uh, questions. I see the chat folks are putting their contact information. Thank you so much. Um, but Emily, I'm going to turn it to you for Q&A or whatever's next. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much um, <clears throat> for sharing all this detailed information this morning. Um, so I have the first question I have is from Mary Kate, um, specifically for Lisa. And um, for Ollie, how do you advertise and promote the program to increase um, the use within or across multiple types of communities? And that is a great question. We're always looking to expand our footprint and serve communities that we're not not currently serving. We um, often say we don't want to be the best kept secret at the University of Pittsburgh, and sometimes it feels like we are. Um, but we are working actively to change that to make sure that all adults who are 50 and better do know about our programs and what we have to offer. And to know that um, just like other aspects of ECA work, you know, there's no degrees required. You don't have to have had any kind of experience with higher education to be a part of the Ali at Pitt program. So to specifically answer that question, we are trying to build our networks with both urban and rural partners to get into both neighborhoods in the city of Pittsburgh that we might not be currently serving, but also our surrounding communities in Butler County and Fayette County in Washington County to kind of reach um, the the other parts of Western Pennsylvania that we might not be able to reach right now and working with those partners by working our networks and then working with our ECA colleagues and our CECs. And um, hopefully this fall, we're actually going to be having, I mentioned in-person classes that aren't here on campus. We hope to have two classes this fall in our Homewood CEC. So by working more intentionally with our, our own team, um, we hope to continue to to, you know, bolster outreach and to meet community needs and make sure that everyone knows about us. Thank you so much, Lisa. I appreciate um, the engagement in the chat as well. It seems like the four of you are, first of all, being so responsive with it, which I appreciate um, and, and um, you know, getting back to folks and thumbs up and everything. I think as a best practice for speakers, I just really appreciate the energy that you are bringing this morning. Um, as a follow-up question, and in addition to all the folks excited to learn more, um, specific around the community workforce training programs, uh, could you speak a little bit more about the activities? Can folks be in place based on specific tr skill training with employers in place, or are there kind of um, some more general lessons or opportunities that can be shared virtually, um, depending on what you're hearing from employers in the region. Uh oh, some I think you might be muted. I'm sorry, Emily, can you do me, can you give me just a quick blurb? I was messing around trying to fix my uh, technology while you were talking. No, you're good. I was going to say we've been battling it this morning. <laughs> and, um, so uh, for the workforce uh, conversation or part of the presentation around like alignment of skills, um, are there in-place opportunities like in person, you know, with employers, with the university as a conduit, or are there, um, or is it more so like information being shared on behalf of like trends that you're seeing um, throughout the region? So it's a little bit of both. <clears throat> I would allow Shatera to share a little bit more, but I'll give just a couple examples of programs that we have in place where people can plug right in. So one is we're a partner in the Innovation District Skills Alliance Program, which is managed by Jewish Family and Children's Services. 
the University of Pittsburgh was the first partner to step to the table and provide a vet tech, a paid vet tech training program that now has onboarded folks into full-time benefits roles here at the University of Pittsburgh. Our newest cohort is going to be moving folks in as security officers with the opportunity to become a police officer um, if they're interested in that. Um, so we're working with um, Pitt in or Pittsburgh Innovation District, as well as JFCS on that. Um, things that Shatera sh shared, like the dental program, right, like the START program, those are in place, but we're really open to hearing what's happening in our workforce. So we work across all 16 schools at the universities, as well as all the major centers. So we have a great, um, we just have a nice view from the balcony, I'll say, to be able to know what's happening across the institution and where there might be some energy and some resources for folks to tap into. So if there's an opportunity, definitely connect with Shatera, right? So she would be able to get to our academic leadership to see, is this something that we're already thinking about? Is this something that's new? Um, but we're a great place to start. I'll jump in and add, thank you, uh, Jamie, for that. And as she stated, yes, um, if you have an idea, you know, of a program, you just have general inquiries, you can reach out to me. Uh, we do convene a quarterly workforce development meeting uh, with our academic leaders across the campus. So if that's not, if we can't find something to plug you in uh, at the institution, we've also been good at aligning folks with other community partners that might be uh, doing similar work uh, to go after joint funding. Thank you so much. Oh, go ahead, Keith. I say you come off mute. I would just add that we'll be excited to share out findings from a, a workforce ladder study for the life sciences that we've been working on with uh, a couple partners as part of our Hazelwood work. Um, we're looking to help ensure that there's um, a whole array of not only lower barrier to entry positions, but also a ladder towards growth within that life sciences industry, both in the short term and the long term. It's anticipated with the BioForge development that's going to unlock a whole host of other industries across the city and the region. So that'll be something that we'll be looking to be proactive on um, with both our coalition folks from Hazelwood as well as broadly speaking. Thank you. That's really helpful. And I, um, I'm happy to send out the results of that report as a follow-up um, once our e-newsletter is behaving again. <laughs> Um, but also directly to folks if necessary. Um, Lisa Rawlings had a question or two. Um, one, uh, what is the impetus for the university moving from the earlier model that you mentioned to now the neighborhood commitment model? Um, and I'll pause there because I think that's a really important question for, for folks on the call. Repeat that one more time for me, Emily. Just want to make sure I got yeah, it right. what was uh, what was some of the impetus for the University of Pittsburgh moving from the previous model of engagement engagement to um, what you describe as the neighborhood commitment model? Yeah, I'll jump in first, and then Jamie, feel free to add in. Um, uh, one of the best compliments I've received in this work was from a nonprofit leader in Homewood who said, "Keith, before." you guys had this community engagement center. I thought there were 5 million professors at the University of Pittsburgh because I would ask to get somebody email me this day for a guest lecture, this day for an internship, this day for a grant partnership and so on and so forth. And while these resources are exciting, um, it can be hard to, to hold up the weight of all these opportunities, especially in the grassroots organizations. We wanted to make sure that we provided a level of coordination and partnership that best positioned these partnerships to be successful for both university and community, right? That's the that's the first part I would share. Um, and it was a really important compliment and something that we look forward to continuing to grow because what we hear now is that things come in a very effective way. And if they're not sure about something, they know who to call, right? Within our staff, um, within our community engagement center team for questions, uh, things of that sort. The other aspect of it is that, um, we believe that community engagement makes for a stronger university, um, that when it's anchored within our ability to teach and to conduct uh, high quality and ethical research in partnership with, um, that it makes for a stronger university, uh, both in access to partnership opportunities, in the quality of educational opportunities that our students receive, um, 
But we also, of course, think that it makes for stronger communities as well, that the ability to combine these resources and, and community goals allows for greater access for organizations for partnership, allows for residents to have greater access to lifelong learning opportunities, both with our Ollie friends and others. Um, and of greatest importance, I think, is that the neighborhood has a stronger say in how the university shows up. Um, we acknowledge past harms um, and really work to address them. Um, one of the ways we do that is through a neighborhood advisory council that allows us to bring forth very clearly projects and proposals for both sanctioning at the neighborhood level as well as co-creation. I always tell our faculty when they come up with a, um, a, a, a partial idea, it's amazing what a savvy group uh, can bring to that at the community level and really flesh out some exciting new partnership opportunities. So each of those items, in my opinion, are really the impetus for this transition and change. Jamie, anything you'd add to that? I would just share that our model is always evolving, right? So part of us being in place are that we're responsive to what we're hearing and where there's energy and resourcing. So whether this is a really emergent idea or whether there's a full coalition that's already at work, we're your partners in sort of sussing out how we can figure out how University of Pittsburgh can come to the table. So the neighborhood commitments model is our way of really showcasing what's possible when you know that somebody's going to be at the table for 20 to 30 years. Um, but our team is really, really committed um, to an adaptive model, which means that if you hear this presentation from us in three years, it's going to be different than today, um, which is a positive. So we're here to think flexibly alongside of you all, and the neighborhood commitment allows us to really, really just show that this is not a fly-by-night investment, right? We're talking millions of dollars. We're talking dedicated folks that are thought partners at the table. So just wanted to offer that as well. Thank you so much to both of you. And I have one more question, um, and I promise this is not an audience plan, even though it's going to align with some of our policy update this morning. Um, but specifically for Lisa, how do you deal with the digital equity divide uh, when providing the remote opportunities to increase ac accessibility? That is a very good question. We did um, participate in the Digital Equity Coalition, and we had many of our current members give input on um, digital equity issues and 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 that uh, divide. We hope um, I mentioned at the at the top of the call that we're going to be moving, and our new space will be larger and it will have more opportunities for our members who do come into campus to utilize computer equipment in our office so that if they do want to take online classes, um, they will be able to do so in our location. Um, we do have many actual courses on basic digital um, skills, how to utilize, but of course, if people don't have the hardware to, to you know, engage in that, then that becomes another barrier. So we have addressed these issues um, to some extent. We certainly have work to do in this area because just like we don't want finances to be a barrier to anybody joining our program, we don't want um, digital access to be a barrier either. I will say there is a small um, portion of our population that just rejects all things digital and is very eager to come to our office, fill out a paper application, pay with a check, and go to their in-person classes. And that is fine. We have those those uh, possibilities available if people are actively choosing not to engage um, because they prefer the in-person experience. But, but we do have work to do to make sure that any kind of equity issues are adequately addressed. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you to Lisa Rawlings for the question. Um, I appreciate the four of you joining us this morning. I do have to um, dedicate the last five minutes of the call to the policy update, um, which we do weekly towards the end of these discussions. Um, but I see that there's still some questions mostly around continuing this conversation, which I think um, you know, demonstrates the success of the call this morning since that was your goal. Uh, do, would you mind, if you haven't already, and I, there are a lot of messages to to scan through, just add in your emails directly to the chat um, so folks can see those right at the bottom in case they'd like to reach out. 
And Jamie, do you have any closing remarks for the group this morning? No, just thanks for the time and we're looking forward to the follow-up conversations. Thank you so much again. Um, and Bree, would you mind launching the poll as I start to share my screen just to go through the, the policy updates? You're gonna see a pop-up in just a moment on your screen. And this is a survey that we conduct weekly to share um, just kind of you know goals with these calls and making sure that it's meeting the needs of the individuals who are joining us on a weekly basis. And I am going to talk through some public policy updates while you are completing that information. So um, for today, a couple of state level updates, um, but first at the national level, you may have seen over the weekend news about President Biden um, signing a $1.2 trillion package of spending bills, I believe it was six bills after Congress passed legislation. Um, this would have resulted, had it not been passed on time, a partial government shutdown with six agencies um, across the federal government. It was passed in a 74-24 vote at roughly 2 a.m. on Saturday. And for anybody thinking, wasn't the deadline at midnight on Friday? Yes, technically, but um, because it was passed, you know, two hours late and it was mostly procedural actions at the time that it was passed, the White House has agreed not to enact any sort of official shutdown operations um, just because of the two hour delay on the procedure pieces. And President Biden's remarks following this passage um, he did reflect on this as a compromise and neither side really getting everything it wanted, which is pretty common rhetoric for a lot of decisions, especially at the federal level. But I mean, even with the divided, um, you know, House and Senate agencies at, at the state levels as well. But it does expand access to child care, invest in cancer research, funds mental health and substance use care, and advances American leadership abroad um, and providing resources to secure the border. Um, it took lawmakers six months into this current budget year to near the finish line. And I know that we've seen this increasingly in past years, again, at the, uh, the state level, in addition to the federal level where there have been late budgets. And so in terms of implications for nonprofit advocacy, um, individuals who receive funding from the state and federal level, there are some revised timelines that we'll be getting into later this year as part of GPNP advocacy capacity building pieces. Um, just kind of sharing what, you know, what we're hearing from nonprofits who have lobbyists that they're working with, what some of these updated timelines um, should look like in terms of outreach rather than January uh, when, you know, gov the, um, the governor proposes his budget. A lot of folks are moving to like November and December outreach to engage with the executive office and members of Congress um, to get on their radar sooner, whether that's for appropriations, specific line items in the state budget, um, or just making sure that individuals know about their organizations and what they accomplish and how that could be related to caucuses or commissions that our elected officials are on. Um, I also want, I can't uh, underline enough the need to reach out to members of executive branches of government as well, um, because that's a whole nother cycle of the implementation process that advocacy is really kind of seeing a shift in timeline for these budgets and their passage um, in, in recent years. Um, but the reason I, I did a shout out for Lisa's question around digital equity is because there have been some updates recently um, throughout Southwest PA on broadband rollout. Most recently, there was an uh, announcement in Beaver County, um, but really across Pennsylvania, there's a lot of county-based officials, uh, largely different commissioners focusing on getting internet service to every resident since 2020 um, using ARPA funds. And so some statistics as, as part, uh, part of this conversation, over 204 new sites have access to broadband um, and more than 1,800 will be uh, able to log on by the end of 2026, which is a huge expansion over the course of two years. Um, 24 million Americans cannot currently access broadband, 28% of those living in rural areas. And so specific to uh, pockets of Southwest PA, we're seeing that same type of accessibility issue. And so um, some of the updates I'll provide specific to the region are going to speak to that 28%, uh, particularly in rural areas, having accessibility issues. Um, 2.7 million Pennsylvania households 
had internet speeds that were slower than FCC minimum standard. Um, and this is as of December 2022, which is also the most up-to-date information. And 23 no low-income Americans, including 759,000 Pennsylvanians, will, Pennsylvanians will lose a $30 monthly FCC subsidy by the end of May, um, which is covered by the Affordable Connectivity Program, or ACP, which um, runs out, like I said, at the end of May. So that funding has not been renewed. What does this mean for our region? Um, there are some significant strides that have been made specifically in Westmoreland, Washington and Beaver County. And just providing an update on those efforts, uh, at a news conference this past Friday, and officials announced that the broadband service had been extended to more than 200 sites in Big Beaver Borough and South Beaver, Darlington and Hanover Townships. Uh, these were among two dozen municipalities identified as high priority since 2021, um, and we're just moving into you know, the phase two and three, um, and even four in some of these areas in terms of implementation. In Westmoreland County, Verizon is partnering um, with the county government to, ex um, to start a project that will bring internet to over 400 sites, specifically in Derry, Fair Fairfield, and Legionnaire Townships. Washington County, is uh, partnering with five internet service providers to stretch 111 miles of fiber optic cable to rural areas and reach 970 underserved homes and businesses. As a shout out to Washington County, I know that there are a lot of places across the state that are really looking to their leadership um, for guidance on this since they're approaching phase four funding at this point, using and leveraging ARPA dollars and starting to talk about the Inflation Reduction Act and bipartisan infrastructure law for credits or opportunities that can be stacked on top of that. Um, so they have a really excellent foundation um, in Washington County. And then Beaver County, as I shared, the commissioners earmarked $11.9 million of the American Rescue Plan Act money for the work, which is going to bring service to more than 1,800 additional homes by the end of 2026. Um, so you can see there's a lot of efforts you know, throughout Southwest PA. There's different metrics for success, depending on the various areas, what the population that has limited access to broadband looks like, where they live, and how that um, the fiber optic cable can reach them. So just, just to share those as quick updates, um, our policy calls this year are going to continue to be talking about that. And looking at uh, next week, April 1st, Etha Kao, Kao is going to be joining us. Um, she's the Director of Digital Inclusion and Innovation at Neighborhood Allies. We had a conversation a few weeks ago um, as part of a larger collaborative discussion about digital equity and just making sure that you know nonprofits and partners are able to um, be aware of and learn about opportunities that Neighborhood Allies has, as well as some other partners who are inv invited to the call. That will be the purpose of our discussion um, next Monday. So I hope to see you then. Thank you so much for the folks who are able to stay on this morning. We appreciate your poll responses. Um, thank you again to our speakers this morning, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Please feel free to email me, emily at forbesfunds.org, if you have any questions, um, particularly about the policy information, because I know we had to cancel our um, meeting this month, but we will be back on time in April, and I hope some of you can participate in that call. Thanks, everyone.